April Day this year. <laughs> that our nation recognizes. Anyway, I'll put it like that. But I'm glad that they do that. Uh, there's also a Father's Day. And uh, they tell us that at one time, there were more phone calls to moms on Mother's Day than there were phone calls to dads on Father's Day, but that has changed because they're collect. <laughs> I'm grateful that I talked to my son, my youngest son yesterday, the one we visited just recently in, in Missouri, and they, uh, he was at a track meet, and Landon, my oldest grandson, uh, came in second in the mile run, and he ran a, a time almost a minute faster than I ran when I was in high school. I'm going to talk to him about that. But that's okay. I'm glad. Take your Bible and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. We'll continue as we work our way through this great letter of Paul to the church at Ephesus. We're going to consider verses 20 to 24 as we consider the topic that arises out of this passage. What does it mean to learn Christ? Because you'll notice in verse 20 that Paul says this. This is an amazing statement. But you have not so learned Christ. Now you say, well, if that stands alone, I don't know what it's talking about. Well, it doesn't. But verse 20 says, But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard Him and have been taught by Him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Now when you consider that, you have to remember what Paul said before this passage. He says, I tell you, verse 17, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. And I could go and I've already preached that sermon, but I wanted you to understand when we consider this, what Paul means when he says, you didn't learn this from Christ. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time. Father, we thank you for this passage. We pray that when we finish it, you, we will know what your man meant when he wrote these words down. Because he got the information from your Holy Spirit who wrote these words down with no errors. And Father, we can read them today and make all kinds of applications. We pray we would do that. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. The world is confused about who Jesus is. The world is confused about who He is and what He taught. But the church should not be confused about either who He is or what He taught. We know, and we sometimes read this in our confessions of faith, He is our Lord our Savior, and our Master. We are to do what He says, even when we might not understand it. As Samuel told Saul, to obey is better than sacrifice. No matter what you do in the name of Jesus, if you do not obey and make obedience a lifestyle, you are like Saul, doing your own thing, rather than God's instruction. And so Paul tells us in this passage and tells the church at Ephesus when they do the things mentioned in verses 17 to 19, they didn't learn that from Jesus Christ. They didn't learn it from Him. And if you do them, you didn't learn it from Him either. I remember hearing Chuck Colson talk about his conversion years ago and how for several years after his conversion... He, he went to parties at the White House, and when they served alcohol, he would drink it. He said he remembered lifting a glass of wine to his lips one particular time and thinking to himself, I shouldn't be doing this. 
He said from that time on, he never took another drink of alcohol. He said, well, what brought him to that point? Someone? A book he read? No, it was someone. But it was the Holy Spirit of God telling him, you are not being a good witness when you do what everybody else does. We're supposed to act like our master in this life. And folks, I'm not saying alcohol is bad. But what did Paul tell the church at Rome? In Romans 14, 21. It is good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles, or is offended, or is made weak. So whatever we do, if it offends someone, and I mean by offending, it makes someone stumble, then we need to quit it, whatever it is, whatever it is. So this is the principle. Never do anything that would cause someone else to stumble. And I know we're probably thinking, man, I wish I could go back over my life and fix all of those times. You see, we have several recovering alcoholics in our church. Do not do anything to cause one of them to stumble. And that includes drinking of alcohol. We often think we can bring into the Christian life just a little bit of the world, just a little bit, and it'll be okay. James Dobson talked about that years ago. He said he caught his children watching a movie that had profanity in it. And he said... Guys, you're not supposed to be watching that. Well, Dad, it's just a little bit. It's not that much. It's not that much. For the next day, he made his children brownies. And if you heard the story, just hold on. He made them brownies. And they're just about to eat those brownies. They look delicious. And he said, now guys, before you eat, I want you to know I put just a little bit of dog poop in those. Just a little bit. It's not much. It won't hurt you, but they wouldn't eat them. And folks, that's the same thing. Why do we think a little bit of the world is okay when this passage says otherwise? There are five implications in this text that will show us clearly that any sin is not to be tolerated. So I pray that our time together will help us make a break with the old way of life and completely become immersed in the new way of life. Let's look at the first implication in verse 20. You did not learn any evil from Jesus Christ. None of us did. The entire New Testament shows us the evil of this world. Jesus does not have to teach us evil. We are born with it. That is a constant in the Bible. What I mean by that, is children have a sinful nature, and if they're not guided, they will follow that till they're an adult. That sinful nature does not go away only if the blood of Christ washes it away. So my point is you cannot follow Jesus and the world. You will forget one and follow the other. Jesus said you cannot serve God in money People think sometimes you can mix the two. But John says in 1 John 2.15, Do not love the world, neither the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's a pretty powerful passage of Scripture. If, when you think of the word world and how John used it, he's not talking about going to the beach. I love the beach. I love to... I told Tom yesterday, I love to take my binoculars and look way out there because sometimes things happen a half a mile off the shore that you will never see at the shore. And I know some of you say, no, you didn't. You're taking those binoculars so you can look at women. No, I don't do that because all I have to do is take my glasses off and I can't see nobody. And I would be a fool to look at another woman with my wife sitting right beside me anyway. Why would I do that? Scripture says, and Job says, I made a covenant with my eyes. I made a covenant with my eyes. I will not look 
upon an unmarried woman, and I certainly won't look at one married. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone does, the love of the Father is not in him. Jesus never taught anyone to live according to the pattern of this world. Never. You can blame him for a lot of things. He did not teach this. Because this world is evil to the core. To the very inner of its being. Let me give you just three examples of that. How, listen closely, how does sex before marriage between two people help society? Oh, it doesn't. As a matter of fact, we have a banquet last night to support the pregnancy care center. That wouldn't need to exist. And then you've got programs of all kinds all over the world, some of them sponsored by churches, to avoid murder of the unborn. Folks, a lot of that starts when two people live as if they're married, but they're not. And folks, that's a crime and a sin before God, and it does not help society at all. How does the abuse of alcohol help society? Most people in the United States, and I say most, and I think I can support that, when they drink alcohol, they do it for one reason, to get drunk. How does that help society? Doesn't. AA is an entity, and you probably know, that helps alcoholics. Then you've got drug rehab, you've got clinics, you've got all kinds of things to help people that have to deal with substance abuse. And then, how does gambling help society? Again, it doesn't. The original 13 colonies had the lottery. Did you know that? And they stopped it because of the crime that came with it. you got Gamblers Anonymous. And I notice when Michael and I watch the NFL that they are into gambling now. They want you to gamble on the game. But if you have a problem, they say, uh, go to this website, bets, betsoff.com. You have a problem with game. I bet you they haven't had anybody go on that website. And I'll say this when I didn't intend to, but how does pornography help society? It doesn't. And yet those things are rampant and sometimes our legislators want to slide in this law or that law that makes those things easier for society to accept. No, they do not help. And you can look at almost any vice in our society and say it doesn't help society. It's amazing that the Christian faith, the Christian walk, according to Scripture, benefits society. It's amazing about that. And yet our world is too blind to see that. John Knox, the reformer of Scotland, took the nation of Scotland and turned it upside down for the Lord Jesus Christ. It became the model country for the world. Why? Because he was a follower of Jesus Christ. That's why. And for people that say, well, I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care if you want to follow him. I don't care. They do care. Because a lot of the laws in our land today are based on this book. You shall not kill. We are to follow him in every way. And any deviation from that does not benefit mankind. The Ten Commandments are there just for that. It teaches you how to respond to God and how to respond to one another. They're not rules for the sake of rules. They're rules because you and I need them. They're God's moral law. And that, Church at O'Brien, will never change. God's moral law will stand the test of time and eternity. 
But let's go on. There's more. Number two, you do not learn about Jesus from the world. Don't go to the world to get your information about Him. I heard Oprah Winfrey say, I consider myself a Christian. You don't have to be one. If you want to know how, ask me. I will show you how. Boy, I'd like to sit in on that conversation. The world will not tell you about the Jesus of the Bible. They will tell you about a created Jesus. You didn't know there was one of those, did you? They will tell you that he was a good man who died a tragic death. They will not tell you he is the Son of God because if they do, then your question to them was why are you not worshiping him? They don't tell you these things. And I think it's... (laughs) I have watched some old clips of Gallagher. You remember stand-up comedian and some of the things he said. He said, why do they call a television a set and you only get one? I thought, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. But look at the... This is amazing to me. This is another... I I think if I'd have told Gallagher, he would have used this. But anyway, everybody wants to take off work on Good Friday. That's the day Jesus supposedly was put in the tomb. Not the day he raised from the dead. And just a few days later on Sunday, those that took off of work on Friday don't come to church. That's crazy. That's the, that's the good day. He was raised from the dead on that day. I'll tell you, you talk to people that are are not followers of Jesus Christ. Oh, they'll tell you more about God than you thought they knew. Oh, God's a forgiving God. Oh, they'll tell you that one. They can't tell you why. They'll they'll tell you this. Uh, He'll make you have a boring life and you won't have any fun. What a shame. Remember Bob Harrington years ago sitting on an airplane with a fellow and he was going to witness to him, but before he could say a word to the fellow, the fellow said, uh, this is when you could smoke on an airplane. He said, I've got a couple of cigars in here. Would you like one of those? And Bob said, no, the Lord saved me from that. And he was getting up the courage to start talking to the fellow about Jesus and the, the people came by serving whatever they serve, and this fellow bought him a mixed drink, and he said, I'll be glad to buy you one if you want one. He said, no, the Lord saved me from that. Well, they didn't hardly get by, and the fellow pulled out a Playboy magazine. He said, I've got a couple of these. Would you like one? And Bob says, no, the Lord saved me from that. He said, the Lord just about ruined you, hasn't he? And that's the way the world looks at it. You can, listen to me, you can only learn about Jesus from His Word and His church. Folks, the world's going to tell you something that's not true. Let me tell you who He is. Because I happen to know Him. Some of you do too, personally. He is the God-man. You say, what do you mean by that? He is 100% God and He is 100% man in one person. One body. You say, how do you know that? Because the scripture says so. In many places. There's no one like him. No one like him. As you you know, sometimes I quote from old rock songs. There was a rock band, and I don't think they're together anymore, called the Scorpions from Germany, and they had a hit song, and it said, there's no one like you. That was the name of the song. It was about a girl. I thought, boy, that's a good song to sing about Jesus because there's nobody like Him anywhere. He's loving and kind, but He's firm. He expects us to live His way, not ruin our lives doing it our way. If you could visit the prisons, the, the, what do they call them around here? It's a ridiculous name. Correctional institution. They're, cor- they're so correctional, people go back sometimes five times before they stay. 
So, folks, what I'm telling you, what the Bible says about God is true of Jesus Christ. Except they're not the same person. Now, if that confuses you, you can join my club. If you understand the Trinity, I'm going to stay away from you. Because no one does. There's nothing on this planet that illustrates the Trinity to us. It's something we have to accept by faith. You got Father, you got Son, you got the Holy Spirit. They are three different personalities, but all three God. If the Holy Spirit tells you not to do something, that's God telling you that. So what the Bible says about God is true about Jesus also. So what are we to do? Hear Him. Be taught by Him. Realize that He is the embodiment of of truth. What did Jesus tell Philip? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But let's go on. There's more. Number three, we're to put off the old man and his ways. You see that in verses 21 and 22. What are we to put off? Well, that appears in verses 17 to 19. That's what we're to put off. And I'm going to quickly run through those. A futile mind, devoid of truth and appropriateness. Appropriateness. I talked about this the Sunday that I preached on that. People don't understand what's appropriate. And they'll say, who are you to judge me on what's appropriate? I'll tell you who I am. I'm a person that doesn't want to look at certain parts of your body. I don't. And if you think I do, then you're fooling yourself. Darkened understanding. That means unwilling to perceive or understand. And many times in our society, it's unwilling. I don't want to hear what God says. I'm not going to read His Word because He'll tell me to stop doing what I'm doing. Yes, He will. Number three, alienation from God. I put that one on the screen. In other words, we are aliens from the life God has for His people. If you're not a child of God, you are an alien. You are an alien from the life of God. Ignorant, lack of knowledge leading to bad behavior. Oh boy. (laughs) Why do people do what they do? If you know the answer to that, write a book. It'll be a bestseller. Blind. One who cannot see what others see. Oh, I can see that, but I can't see that. You wonder why there are people in our culture that say it's okay for a man to identify as a woman. Folks, they're blind. I could call them other names, but blind, I'll stop with that. And then callous. The new King James says being past feeling. Callous. And the last thing, given to lewdness, working uncleanness and greediness. These things, folks, that I have listed make up the everyday life of those apart from the grace of God. That's the world we live in. We can like it or we can change it. The old nature or the old man grows corrupt according to lying desires. Paul says that right here in the text. Folks, you don't wake up one day corrupt. It's a process. But let's go on. There's more. Paul is encouraging this church and obviously these problems that he mentions in verses 24 or 20 to 24 were problems they were facing in their church. And I believe, as a pastor, that every church faces some of that. But number four, we are to be renewed in our spiritual mind. You see, this is in contrast to the old man growing corrupt. It's the opposite of that. Being renewed in your spiritual mind. You say, well, Brother Keith, how do we do that? How will we be renewed by the Spirit in our mind? Well, folks, let me tell you something. First of all, you cannot divorce your mind 
from the Christian life. There are people that think you can. Christianity is a thinking person's religion or faith, whatever you want to call it. It requires thought. You're not going to read this book without thinking about what you read. You can't. It's impossible. We need to be thinking about what we read and understand it. You see, the mind in the New Testament and the Old Testament is a synonym for the heart, the seat of our emotions. That's where you feel things. I've told children in children's church, my hand never feels happy. My mind does. And then I can tell my hand to act happy. Beth has to tell us sometime in the choir, put a smile on your face. Act like you believe what you're singing. And the reason we do that is, I remember what Charles Spurgeon told his students in the college. He said, when you talk about heaven, let your face light up, let your countenance glow. But when you talk about hell, well, your ordinary face will do You see, the mind is a synonym for the heart. And the mind is an open book for two things. Sin and virtue. Sin and virtue. We must be on guard every minute we are awake to keep sin out. You say, well, Brother Keith, what about when we're asleep? Well, you don't have to worry about it when you're sleeping. Because John says in 1 John, he says this. You're listening, aren't you? He says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ does what? Cleanses us from all sin. Brothers and sisters, when you're sleeping, the Holy Spirit of God takes care of. He does. He's watching over you. You say, well, what about my guardian angel? I don't know if you have one. Some of us need one. I know that. And sometimes I'm afraid when we get to heaven, they're going to run up to us and thank God that we're there because they don't have to take care of us anymore. We must be on guard to keep sin out. We do that by staying away from old habits. I have changed habits all my life. I thank God I never got... Uh, I smoked a cigarette or two when I was younger. I smoked more than, than one cigar. And folks, I said, why am I doing this? Because when I smoke it, it smells bad. And I think you know the rest of that story. It puts a horrible taste in your mouth. But anyway, that's, that's another story. Stay away from old habits. Stay away from temptation. I mentioned this to you. A guy called me on the phone one day and said, I have a problem with alcohol, and I asked him, who buys it for you? Well, I do. What do you want me to say? Stop buying it. It doesn't make sense. You say, well, you don't know the pull alcohol has. I know the pull money has. I think we all do. We must be on guard to keep sin out because sin is deceptive and devious. Sin will tell you, oh, if you do that, you're going to, you're going to have so much fun you'll never get over it. And if that doesn't work, it will flat out lie to you. It will find a crack in your armor. Paul told the church at Rome in Romans 13, 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Because if you read the New Testament, you will find out the Apostle Paul had nothing good to say about the flesh. This. Nothing good. Romans 7, 18, he says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. 
Don't, don't you know that's why when we leave this earth, when we pass from this life to the next, we get another body that's not like this one. It's what we call a glorified body. It will not be touched by sin. You say, well, Brother Keith, I can't even imagine that. No, probably none of us can. But it's got to be better than this one. It's got to be. You see, our minds need to be renewed day by day because the world has a very strong pull. And boy, does it. To resist that pull, our minds have to be renewed daily. You say, how do you renew your mind? Right here. Right here. Read this book. Read it. And then read it again. And you say, well, Brother Keith, I don't know where to start. Start anywhere. You'd be surprised what God can tell you. Anywhere you read. Because this is His Word. He's the one inspired men to write it down. This is God's book. And it's our instruction book on how to get through this life without killing ourselves. You have to renew your mind daily. And then number five, and you see that right in the text, in verse 24, what does he say? You put on the new man. The idea of put on is like when I got dressed this morning, the last thing I put on was this jacket. I wanted to make sure it matched my pants before I went any further. It does. But my wife picked it out, so I knew it would. But it's putting it on. He says earlier, put off. Take these things off. Now folks, I'm going to tell you something that maybe you don't understand. You can do that. He's not telling you to do something you cannot do. He's telling us to do something that we can do. Of course, we do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. But we do it because it is good for us. So we're to put on the new man. This includes... Or this indicates that every true believer becomes a new man. Now, lady, don't get upset. I'm not telling you you have to become a man. I'm using the biblical terminology. I'm not talking about gender here. I think I mentioned before, and it's very important for us to see, that men and women are adopted into the body of Christ. We are adopted as an adult son because the daughter didn't get an inheritance. The son did. And ladies, when you come to Christ, you're as much guaranteed to get an inheritance as I am or any other man. Every true believer becomes a new man. And Barnes, Albert Barnes had remarks to say, and I'm going to read this because it's too long for me to memorize. He said this, talking about the new man. He has new feelings, principles, and desires. He has laid aside his old principles and practices and in everything that pertains to moral character, he is new. His body is the same. The intellectual structure of his mind is the same. But there has been a change in his principles and feelings which make him in all the great purposes of life a new being. Learn that regeneration is not a trifling change. It's not a small thing. It's not a mere change of relations or of the outward condition. It's not merely being brought from the world into the church and being baptized, though by the most holy hands. It is much more. None of these things would, could make proper the declaration, He is a new man. Regeneration by the Spirit of God does. And it's the only thing that can do that. A new person. You say, Brother Keith, can you prove that? Yes, I can because I look out on this congregation and I see proof everywhere. I remember my one of my early high school class reunions when I went there and they found out that I was preaching the gospel some of those people said, I never thought Keith Jones would be doing that. Well, I could have put my two cents in there too. I never thought I would be doing that. But when God calls, 
you listen. And he did. Not only that, the scripture supports this because Paul wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He also wrote his second letter to the church at Corinth, chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new, what? Not creature, creation. A new creation. Old things pass away. Matter of fact, he says old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now let me give you some practical ideas and we'll be done. When you become a child of God, before you became a child of God, you might not have liked church people. Nobody said amen. But I'm sure you probably didn't like church people. I didn't even like it when Christians in my family kept asking me these most ridiculous questions. Have you trusted Christ yet? Are you a Christian yet? Have you been baptized yet? And I got tired of hearing it. So I didn't like church people. And I went to church every Sunday. And some of those ladies and some of those men, I remember Sunday school teachers that I had when I was a kid. They would talk about the, the new birth, talk about being born again. I'd say, oh, you poor people, y'all don't know what life's all about. And God kind of snickered. Because he said, son, I'm going to show you what life is all about and you're not going to like it. And he was right. He was so right. When I found out what the world was all about, my parents kind of sheltered me to some point. When I found out what the world was like, I didn't want anything to do with it. It was like in Isaiah chapter 6 when Isaiah saw the Lord and all of those things that were happening in the temple at that time around the throne of God. And you know, the, there's no preaching going on. There's no a scripture being read, you've just got these beings flying around the throne of God saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the, the doorpost shook and the temple filled with smoke. And what does Isaiah do? Woe is me! You didn't have to tell me that sin was bad. I realized it then. Because I came face to face with it. Have you put off the old nature and put on the new? You see, just like Mr. Barnes said, our intellectual structure of our mind stays the same. Nothing changes there. The body's the same. When I became a Christian, I didn't lose 10 pounds and put on more muscle. I didn't get more hair. None of that happened. The body's the same. But the driving force behind what a true believer does is not the world or the old nature. It is the Spirit of God. And the more we allow Him to direct us, well, Romans 8, 14 says it, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So I encourage you as a church, and folks, I'm not... I have nobody in mind when I say this. Make up your mind to follow the leading of the Spirit as He directs and places us into situations where we can grow or we can speak the truth of the Gospel. Because you see, this life is not about our goals. I hope you have goals in life. I hope you do. But it's not about our goals. It's about Him and His plans. Someone said only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Put off the old, put on the new. Debbie and I watched a movie last night at the end of it. There was a fellow singing a song. I don't know who he was. I didn't look at it. But he said, all we're trying to do is leave something behind. What do you want to leave behind? Just this past week, 
I had a cousin who passed away. She and I were not very close. She lived down in Tampa area. And the times that I talked to her, she was fun. She was a lot of, she was very bubbly. Her personality was. But she had some deep emotional problems. And I'm not going to blame it on her dad or her mother. Because I don't know all of the situation. But when she passed away, that was the end of a legacy. No one left. And folks, I'm not telling you just have kids so you'll have somebody to carry on after you're gone. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, well, how are people going to remember you? Are they going to remember you as a kind, caring person who loved Jesus? Or are they going to remember you some other way? Because it does matter. It does matter. I think the idea is, and we read through the New Testament especially, you find out you ought to live your life so that people who come behind you would find you faithful. I believe that's a song that was sung sometime. I think Steve Green sang that, that may all who come behind us find us faithful. And that means children and adults. Have you put off the old and put on the new? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for passages like this that so get to the core of our being, but they also, not only they do that, but they show us the futility and the wastefulness of the world in which we live. That doesn't mean that we don't go to the same grocery store, we don't wear similar clothes as the rest of the world or drive vehicles similar to the rest of the world but father we are to be different we should not be the same as our unsaved neighbor there should be a noticeable difference and if there isn't there is a spiritual problem that needs to be dealt with and I pray father that spiritual problem will be dealt with and has been dealt with by the Holy Spirit as we've gone through this service today. I know when I prepared this, there were times I had to stop and examine my own self. Because Father, how can I get up and tell others what they need to do when I'm not doing it myself? And so Father, my goal in this sermon, and I know sometimes your goal and my goal don't match up but I'm going to go with yours every time. You do what you want to do. You do what you know to do. And that's fine with me. My goals are not important. Yours are. Help us as your children to put off the old and put on the new. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us? What a great song to close on.